As someone who teaches blockchain engineering and Solidity programming, I get asked a lot, what does it take to get a job in Web3? Even as crypto prices have crashed, I still have noticed a lot of interest among programmers in the subject. This includes people who picked up programming recently. In fact, I've even seen people who picked up programming specifically because they wanted to work in Web3. And that's really cool. But a lot of the information online is not helpful. It says, learn Solidity and then you'll find a great job. But how much Solidity do you need to learn and what kind of a job is this going to be? This gets even more complicated if you are an engineer living in a developing nation, like Indonesia where I currently live now. It isn't clear what exactly are the expectations to one, get a Web3 job, and then what additional expectations, if any, to get one remotely when you live in a time zone far away from your employer. Because I have this conversation so frequently, I decided to record this conversation with Saeed and myself, with his permission, of course. Saeed's story is very similar to a lot of up-and-coming software engineers in nations outside of the European Union and America. They often wonder, what does my career strategy look like, where should I be applying for jobs, and at what point am I ready? I recorded this because I hope it will be beneficial to people who are in a similar situation to Saeed. Now, about myself, I used to be a engineering manager at Yahoo, and I hired engineers for the jobs that people covet. I stopped working for Yahoo after I moved out to Asia, and I've focused in the blockchain industry since then. I talked to a lot of hiring managers about what their needs are, so I think I have a pretty good sense about what exactly it takes to get a job in Web3. So I hope this video is helpful. Please well, enjoy. Great to meet you, Saeed. Hello. All right. Um, I guess the purpose of this call is to discuss general career advice for software engineers. So maybe you could tell me a bit about yourself. Uh, I'm Said. I'm from Indonesia. For the last three years, I work as mobile telecommunication engineer for one of telco operator in Indonesia. My work is related to system engineering for like 4G network and 5G. It is non-programming and non-software development job. Although at some time we do migrate some of our service cloud and also tech certification like from Google, Azure, and I also pass Kubernetes certification. Mm -hmm. But besides my work, I also try to explore programming and developing some application as a hobby. So I do know about programming before I learn about Web3. Mm -hmm. And how I got interested into Web3 is basically now and heard about Web3 and blockchain from like two years ago when DeFi projects start getting popular, but mostly checking what is going on and just using the application and not developing anything until earlier this year, I start getting interested into Web3 development. Mm -hmm. But I intense learning about Web3 for the last four months. So after work and in the weekend, I really start to explore and deep dive into the Web3 development. So I follow a few tutorials about Ethereum, Solidity, EtherJS, Arthead, Travel, and Unit Testing. I also learn about React and Next.js because I think it is the most popular front-end framework for Web3. I also learn about the ecosystem like Morales, Protocol, Oracle solution like Chainlink, and Tartu or L2 solution like Polygon. So the first two months, basically, I built a lot of plan projects like NFT marketplace, automated market maker, lottery apps, and all the basic things. With some books about DeFi to understand the how the DeFi protocol works. I also try to understand different roles in Web3, especially in the development side. So like blockchain protocol developers, the builder of the underlying infrastructure, and smart contract developer, and then the auditor and front-end developer. So I think that is the, the four main role, if I'm not mistaken. So before I decide about which role I want, I will create some project. Maybe I will share the repo in it. Maybe you can give some feedback later on. Oh, yeah, that'd be it. So I try to use all the tools that I have learned and to create something that is not built by other people, basically, to test how far my understanding about Web3. And after that, I create this project. I start to applying job and boot camps. Two months ago, I get accepted into ZK Rollup Bootcamp by Encode. If you ever heard about en Encode, I, I think you, you yeah, know. Yeah, definitely. Mm -hmm. So I learned ZK solution and the ecosystem. And I get interested in StartNet ecosystem and decide to learn Cairo. So I tried to rebuild my previous application in Cairo and I submit it for the hackathon. The result is not yet out, so hopefully I won it. I think that's basically it. So I'm sure I want to switch career into this space. I kind of feel lost about where am I now in terms of progress to be qualified as junior developer role. Mm -hmm. I see. So how many jobs have you applied to so far in Web3? 
I think it's more like 15 to 20, maybe. Okay. And what uh, outcomes have you had with it? Have you heard back from any of them? Have you gotten any interviews? So or? the one that give feedback is actually from intercept position from Nethermind. Mm -hmm. They give like, what should I know before applying to their internship role? But I guess what what they suggest me to study is basically what I have learned so far. So I'm kind of lost. Mm -hmm. Okay. So have you moved forward with the interview or what's what's the state of the Nethermind interview? So far, I'm not getting any interview from the position that I apply. So. Okay. I'm sure you can't remember all 15 to 20, but first of all, good for you for sending out applications because... That's yeah. a very, a lot of people don't send out enough applications and job applications are a numbers game. The more applications you send, you know, the better your chances. Can you tell me something about the companies that you're applying to? Like where are they located? What kind of roles are they? Just generally, you don't have to tell me every single one if you don't remember. So mostly I apply to position that open for remote option. Mm -hmm. Right. Are these smart contract roles? Are they front end roles? Can you describe which Mostly, I play for Solidity Developer. Mm -hmm. It seems like you've covered a lot of ground, which is really nice. Uh, if you've gone so far as to, you know, study DeFi and the protocols and Graph, and so, how long have you been doing this now? So I start to deep dive into this Web three for like four or five months. For okay, all right. So you've been doing it pretty intensely then. I guess here's a couple things that stand out to me. Well, first of all, we should probably look at your GitHub soon. So if you guess you can send it so I can kind of get an okay. idea of the complexity of what you're doing. There's two other things that come to my mind right away. One is 15 to 20 jobs is not a lot in the grand scheme of things. In order to have some real information, you need to have maybe 50 to 70 applications. In the first stage, most hiring managers are not looking at people's GitHub. They're looking at people's resume. If you don't mind uh, sharing that, I can knock out the parts that I don't want to put on the video. Maybe that can tell me because something I've noticed with software engineers a lot of the times is the resume can seem something that's very trivial. Like oh, what matters is your skills, not your resume. But the resume does matter because people look at it and then make a decision in about five seconds about whether or not they're going to move forward or not. So what people see in the first five seconds can make all of the difference in the world. Like, for example, in my case, I could say at the top of my resume, I was a machine learning engineer at Yahoo. All right, that sounds pretty cool. But what if I say, I built Yahoo's video machine learning platform? Both of those sentences can be said in about five seconds, but they convey very different things. So it is worth optimizing what you're putting there. So actually, why don't I, in addition to the resume, could you share a couple of projects that are particularly noteworthy, like the ones that you're most proud of? So I think the two uh, the first GitHub two. link I, I sent in this chapter. So the first two, right? Yeah. Okay. Let me just share my screen to make sure that I don't have any issues. Okay. So over here we have a notification protocol. So what I try to build is, I don't know if you ever heard about Saweria. What's that? In Indonesia, it's very popular thing. So basically, if you are a live streamer in YouTube, mm -hmm. you can set up overlay on your stream. Okay. And it will link to a page where you can donate the streamer and the, not the notification of your donation and your message will be shown in, in the stream. Mm -hmm. So I basically try to create a clone of that Got uh, using cryptocurrency as a payment method. And also uh, the streamer can set up an NFT so that their fans can mint it and it will be shown in the live stream. And this is done with... Do you have a front end for this or...? Yeah, yeah. I also... Uh, the front end. Okay. So, well, this is very nice. Uh, I don't have a uh, cleat in my wallet. So, okay. But this is the Starknet version, right? Okay. Wow. Well, okay. This website is quite nice. All right. Let's see here. Okay. So here is the first thing that I can comment. One is when I look at this, the first thing that I see is that you work in telecommunications, right? That's the first thing that I'm going to see. The other thing is that this is a pretty big wall of, this is a lot of text here, so it's very hard to read fast. Okay. Now down here, I can see some very relevant, let's say I was hiring you for a software role. In that case, we would see, oh, okay, there's some relevant keywords over here, but they're buried inside of a bunch of other text. So I won't see it right away. Okay. And the other thing I would see here is, okay, he currently works at Telcom Cell, which is, you know, it's, it's not known to be a software company. And certainly if you're applying for a remote job, then 
people outside of Indonesia are not going to know what telecom cell is. What you want to have is you still you still want to show your work experience. But what I would do is actually put this much further to the top. These two things okay. I would put these up here and then maybe put work experience below that because you want them to see telecom cell after they see what you're capable of over here. OK, this is good because this shows some legitimacy if you graduated from there. Uh, what else have we got? This needs to be condensed. So it's already clear that you have a good background in telecommunications from over here. Over here, chances are DevOps is not going to be relevant and Android are not going to be relevant okay. to the project you're applying for. The other thing that would kind of tip me off is it, it looks like, OK, you graduated in 2018, but you're covering a lot of technologies over here. So it would be a little bit hard for me to understand, OK, how could this person be good at all of these different technologies? Now you have a certification, OK, which is which is good, but companies tend to care more about experience not tend to, they pretty much always care more about experience than certification. I would actually not even mention this. I mean, if you do it as a side project, then, you know, maybe you can put it further down as an experience thing, just to show that you have curiosity. But over here, it looks, since you're mentioning it in the same setting as your actual work, then it might look like you're covering too much stuff because people who put too much experience on a resume in such a, in a relatively short amount of time, it looks like a red okay. flag often. So now let's talk about doing your Web3 experience. So first of all, once you hit the six month mark, maybe it is worth pointing out that you've been working in Web3 for six months or so, or you've been doing projects. Because when you look at the projects, it's hard to tell if did this person do it over the course of a weekend or a few months or how serious is this person about it? Now, the fact that you went to encode shows that you're serious. So that's something that you want to emphasize. The other thing is you want to be thinking about where else can I get legitimacy from? Because, you know, people say, okay, projects are a good thing to get yourself hired when you haven't been doing Web3 before. That's kind of true. But the problem is from the outside, just looking at it, all projects look the same when you're a hiring manager. Okay, everybody has done an NFT on the resume when they're right. applying for a Web3 job. So if you put that there, it does not look unique. You want to be talking about the stuff that other people don't have. You have, okay, you've experienced with StarkNet and ZK rollups. Those are cool, those stand out. The other things I would think about is, okay, have you completed the Ethernaut and Damn Vulnerable DeFi? A lot of job applications expect people to do that. And if you've done them, it shows that you're serious about it. So at least just adding a few bullet points. Yes, I've studied security mm -hmm. seriously. Maybe even did a couple of write-ups about it so that you know you can see you actually understand the solution is something else that you can help drive the point home with. Another thing that we really talk about a lot at Rare Skills in terms of making your application really pop is contributing to open source projects. Because if you contribute to an open source project, that's almost like you worked at the company. You know, if they accepted your pull request or at least seriously engaged with you, that legitimizes you. How to find open source projects to contribute to is a whole nother topic. But that's another thing that you can do. And it, it is clear to me that you have you're really starting to coalesce into a pretty solid understanding of the Web3 ecosystem. But looking at it, it's hard to tell what your specialization is. Like, what roles are you really suited for? Are you going to be a smart contract engineer? Are you going to be a front-end engineer? Are you going to be... It's just not clear to me. One thing you could do now, I would say, is there's a lot of NFT projects, especially in Indonesia. Well, I mean, a lot of NFT projects have gone down. But for you, I don't think it would be hard to convince someone to hire you as someone. Oh, I need, we need someone to develop our minting website. You're clearly capable of that, and you can do a good job. But that's obviously not a permanent job because that's something that is you have to keep selling yourself over and over again. One thing that will be pretty steady is if you can, there are a lot more front end jobs than there are Web3 jobs. Now, I know Web3 is more exciting, but there will always be a good market for someone who can write a well-written website, one that's tested, one that's fast, one that you know how to make the components load in the correct order have a sensible use of animations without slowing it down, how to delay loading certain sections of the website. So like if you how to maintain a big website and how to do end to end testing, uh, if you can do that well, that is an easy ticket to getting a good job from a nice company overseas. Not an easy ticket, but it's a proven path, I would say. And you can have companies like, you know, Turing or TopTal find the people for you and they'll They'll give you the work now if you're really so that's if you care about salary and a steady job if you care about web3 for its own sake and not because of the money then like i said if you, you can start working on open source stuff pretty soon if not now and that's 
probably going to be more fulfilling than working at a regular company because a regular company is going to go, hey, we need this because of money. Open source is going to say we need this because of purpose, <laughs> right? So it, it's just always going to be more fun. So I would be thinking, you know, what is important to me? Is it that I want to be working in Web3 for its own sake or is it because I want to make a high salary? And it's okay if there's nothing wrong with wanting a high salary or being interested in okay. Web3. But you have to really know for yourself, which one do I want and which strategy am I optimizing for? Because they're quite different. If you want to make money soon, uh, front end is way faster. If it's because you can show that you're able to deliver. With Solidity, having four or five months of experience is really going to work against you and not having any, and it's still going to take you time to get a brand name open source contribution on your resume or work with a recruiter until you can get into a company. What do you think? What, what, what are your goals? Uh, yeah, I think I'm interested about yeah, your comment in video about geographic. I would say disadvantage for me because of the company in Web3 is have a very different time zone from Indonesia. So how about that? As long as you can be so good that people have to accept you, then you will always be able to solve the problem. The difficulty is getting to that point is a very, very long and hard journey, regardless okay. of which vertical you take. Web3 is not a shortcut to it. In fact, in some cases, it can be the long, the longer path. Being from an you know an international country, people can oftentimes perceive, oh, it's cheap, therefore the quality must be lower, right? That's just a, that is just a stigma that is gets in the way whether it's true or not. In in order to get a Western job, I did uh, one of my friends. He's in Indonesia. He got a Western job recently. Going the route of working through an, the, the developer agencies that are reputable is the I think the most reliable way to get a six-figure salary out here, because it's very hard to get a six-figure salary in Indonesia, unless you're right at the executive level. And as an engineer, it's the, the market is just not that big. You have to get it from an overseas company. And the only two ways to do that are one, to immigrate to the West or to get a remote job. There's I hired a for one of the companies I'm advising right now. I just hired someone using one of these platforms, Gun.io. They didn't sponsor this video or anything. And we're paying the agency $13,000 a month, US. So as long as that guy is keeping $9,000 out of that $13,000, he's making $100,000. This has nothing to do with Web3. There is no, this is just a regular company. Yeah, but how do you get to that point? It's largely about, okay, get some experience on your resume, make sure you can do well at the data structure and algorithms questions. That's 80% of it. Okay. And the other thing that you'll have to do is you do have to demonstrate some experience. And this is kind of where it will get annoying because it's going to be hard to, you're not going to be able to get that kind of a job right away. People want to okay. see this person has experience working on software systems. So that may mean that you will have to work at a traditional company like Tokopedia or Grab or something for a while as a software developer and work your way up to senior and work your way up to, you know, higher levels to show that, yes, I know how software works in a company setting. I've seen these kind of problems before because what makes tech companies scared to hire people for high paying jobs is the, the reason why they're high paying is not because the skill is so scarce per se. It's because I just can't find someone I really trust to handle this really critical thing. Like, so whoever's going to work on our web app, they better do a good job because if it crashes, the customers are going to be angry and we're going to lose all of our money. Yeah, yeah. So, of course, you're going to pay a lot of money for someone to do a good job. But how do you know that they're going to do a good job unless they've done a good job somewhere else first? What's annoying about that is it does mean you will have to work at a regular company. There's not any major Web3 companies out here in Indonesia. So if you want to work at it, the most brand name you're going to get is something like, you know, Tokopedia, Grab Shop. Well, I guess if I don't know if they have an office out here, but, you know, companies like that, which you can if you study for the algorithm interview stuff and you show your front end work, which is obviously which is amazing, to be honest, you'll get those jobs very easily. And while you're at the job, if as long as you apply yourself and just outwork everyone, you can get promoted faster. Situations to avoid are one is you're not working on stuff that's where you're learning things and moving forward. If that's the case, you should switch companies. But a lot of people switch companies because of salary, you know, which is fine. Make, make sure that you keep the long-term goal in mind. Yeah. You don't want to be optimizing salaries locally because that's not necessarily going to make your com application competitive for when you're applying for the international job in America or yeah. Great Britain or whatever. They're not going to look for someone who is a good manager over here. They're looking for someone who's a good technologist 
And unfortunately, one of the ways to move up the ladder here is get really good at business and product. The people who own the business is, oh, this person speaks my language. You know, they understand business and product. Let's promote them, even though they're not that good at engineering necessarily. You can make a short term win by playing that game, but it's not going to help you when you interview for the American companies because they want to see, well, have you worked on a large scale code base before? How did you handle it? What were some of the best practices that you used or you implemented yourself? So have in your mind, what does the ideal engineer look like to the American company? And turn yourself into that. They're looking for someone who's worked on a big system, uh, someone who knows how to do things at scale, or someone who's seen a product from start to finish or added a major feature to a very visible product. These are the things where you can say, hey, look, I built Tokopedia's, you know, I made their search page 20% faster or something like that. That's a really, really big deal, right? Because if someone waits too long, then they leave the app and there's no revenue. So try to be thinking about what are these wins that I can describe in five seconds that are going to show that I'm really good and then work your way towards getting them. That's the first part, unfortunately. That's that's what you want to show on your resume to get them to take you seriously and pay you a lot. The second part is you do have to pass the algorithmic interview questions. You may have heard of lead code by now and the data structure algorithm stuff. I know a lot of people don't like it, but it's a solid way to prove that you're good. Someone who can do well at lead code is not a bad engineer. Now, someone who does bad at lead code might still be a good engineer. But what it shows is, okay, this person has discipline, they care about their craft, and they know how to think computationally, and they obviously have to have experience debugging, because when you're doing all of these fancy manipulations of data, a lot of things can go wrong. You demonstrate that, yeah, I have a really, really solid foundation. The agencies are going to sell for the foreign engineers like that. Hey, they passed the same interview that the people at Google and Facebook take. Well, maybe not at that level of difficulty, but the same style of interview. And that makes the American companies feel more safe. Like, okay, so if this person, you know, is at least within firing distance of one of the major tech companies in the US, they can't be bad. So I'm okay with trusting my product to them. Because software engineers, we play a very critical role in any stage of a company. A startup, we build the product badly. It doesn't matter how good the idea is or how good the marketing is. There's nothing to sell. On a big company, we can crash it, make all of the customers angry. Showing that you're serious is really, really important so that they feel like they can trust you. There's no shortcut to it. I think Web3 is oftentimes sold as a shortcut to, hey, you know, Web3, it's a high demand skill. You can get a high paying job. It's not a good strategy. If you keep networking aggressively, you might be able to find a small Web3 company that you can get a reasonably good salary at. But you kind of have to find a middle ground where they're not so small that they're so poorly funded that they can't pay you well anyway. And they're hiring you because they can pay you the rate you're already getting. But if they're, a real, let's look at an extreme example like Uniswap. Uniswap can hire anybody they want to. Forget about trying to get a job there. It's way too competitive and their bar is very high. So you're trying to target, you know, maybe a small, but not too small where the business owner doesn't know what he's doing. Not that people who have small businesses don't know what they're doing, but if you don't know what you're doing, you're not going to be able to, it's going to be very hard to raise funding. You can still do it, but on average, it's harder. You're trying to aim at that, just that right level. But that will require a lot of work on your part to find those companies. And you have to do a lot of networking. And it's a, and it becomes harder when you're in the side of the world, right? So okay. if money is the goal, I would say get an established job at a software company that is as recognizable as possible and get promoted there to at least senior engineer. If you, the higher you can go, the better, but don't lose touch with the tech. When you become a manager, don't get stuck in a bunch of meetings and not doing coding anymore. You want to show that you're a really solid technical person because that's what they're trying to hire for in America. You should know product and business so that you can speak the language. You know, it makes for good communication, but primarily they're hiring you for your technical abilities. Speaking of communication, that is something American companies value a lot. Make sure that you can write well and deliver a presentation well. Practice that because when you're trying to talk about very complicated concepts like technology and how you're meeting the future, these are very difficult things to describe clearly and succinctly. And especially when you're on the other side of the world, if you can't be very clear quickly, then that really gets in the way of communication. So how can I get to the point and explain it in such a way that a person who has no context understands exactly what's going on? And that takes skill to develop that. So now lead code is more important, but you should still make time every other week, I would say. Practice writing an article. Practice giving a presentation, maybe get someone to give you feedback. You do that and you tell the interviewer that you're doing that, they will be impressed because nobody does that. Remember, you do the things that nobody else does. That's what, oh my gosh, this person is amazing, right? What yeah, I've seen I think I like your different take for this web yeah, because unfortunately, a lot of, you know, people selling course saying that getting into the web is easy. You take this course and then you get a job. 
but I like your video because you clearly said what is actually going on the, in this space and how to actually become a good solidity engineer and it it requires time to to actually get the high paying job but my goal is actually just to get into this space and get the job so that currently my, my job is not related to web3 so obviously i can only have i would say production experience so mm-hmm. so i think that is the most important thing for me i would say if you're not able to get a web3 job it's still okay to get a web2 job because it shows you have years of experience doing software the people who get these high salary web3 jobs already have high paying web2 jobs if the web3 jobs are high paying is because the web2 jobs are high paying i mean i'm referring to countries where the salary is high Right over here where the salaries are not as high than you, the premium you get for web. Th- I mean, I know some Indonesians who work in Indonesia at Web3 companies, and maybe they're paid not more than 15 million a month or something like that. So, which, okay, not bad, but that's not the levels that people are advertising, right? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Salary is not the, the most important things for me right now. Yeah, but other thing that comes to my mind is... What is your opinion about becoming auditor and competing on auditing platform like Code for Arena? Mm-hmm. Uh, well, first of all, I think use, reading Code Arena reports will do nothing but help you. Being around people who are just really good at their job rubs off on you. So I would say that's productive. But in terms of becoming an auditor, well, I can tell I one of my students got a job offer at Trail of Pits as a security apprentice. Okay. The, his background was... He had already had a cybersecurity certification. He had been doing software already for about six years, not at an established company at all. It was maybe a level above doing WordPress for the most part. So not not that serious in terms of software. But he did do all of the hacking exercises that I talked about. He even wrote his own capture the flag exercises. So he made problems that are similar to Ethernet and whatnot and or damn vulnerable DeFi. And that really showed that he's serious about the subject. So you combine all of that together and his profile and he got it. Now it's the lowest level of security auditor you can get, but Trail of Bits is a very serious company. It's one of the best uh, auditing firms in the Web3 space. I mean, you could argue they're the best depending on who you're talking to, but they're definitely up there. So So that's what it took for him to do it. And interesting part of the interview, well, I'm not sure how much I can share, but there were a lot of applicants well over 100 we can from what I can infer from all of the data. Now they can obviously like trim people down quickly by with the interview thing. But we worked really hard on his resume to show that, hey, yes, you should give me a shot at this test hacking exercise. And I would say that was important in terms of getting his foot in the door and then actually executing the interview he he did well on. In terms of being an auditor, try it out. I've had some people come to me who are like, Jeffrey, I w- I join Rare Skills. I want to become an auditor. And then they go through all the hacking exercises. And this, this is the most annoying thing in the world. I hate it. So uh, try it. <laughs> And then they do not want to be auditors after that. So try it out. That will tell you more about if you're so passionate about it, that it's the only thing you want to do, I think, then, you know, work, do what you enjoy. Work at it. Yeah. Even if it takes a year to get there, then try to try to get a cybersecurity job. And uh, if you can do well in code arena, then that's going to show Okay, there's external. Remember, I keep talking about legitimacy uh, or external validation. You're not going to do well on Code Arena without being good, right? So you get so a very established brand, Code Arena, saying this person knows what they're doing. So that can only help you. If you're working on, you know, security oriented hackathons or finding bugs yourself, that's going to, it doesn't matter if you're in Indonesia at that point. They're going to be like, wow, this person yeah. can find bugs. Yeah, let's hire him. Yeah. But I think that is the, the main reason because those mm-hmm. platform. Basically, they they are permissionless, mm-hmm. so I can even be anonymous, and yep. there's no need to pass a job interview to submit. But obviously, it requires high skill and experience. Yeah, yeah. I've done competitive programming before in the field of machine learning. To place in the top ten in an international contest full of people who were really good, I basically had to work full overtime over one month. I took time off of work and just through everything i every last bit of mental energy i had at the at the problem and that was in machine learning and i for already one had problem. for one problem well there was only one problem that we were being okay. evaluated on and i already had a couple of years of experience going into it more than a couple it was hard and the only thing that got me through it was i wanted it so badly 
I liked the problem, but more importantly, I wanted to win. And I was going to stop at nothing until I got there. And I had been through other contests before that I failed at. I had to build up some experience to get to that point. Like, okay, yes, I know all the pieces that I need to piece together in order to have the best performing machine learning model. And any competitive platform that's visible is going to be like that, whether it's traditional competitive programming or, in this case, uh, security audits. Because everybody can see it, it attracts the best people. They know that being up there helps their brand a lot. So they're, these very smart people are investing time into it, even though they're not making, they might not make that much money into it. And they have more experience than you. And if you're not more motivated than they are and you're not willing to work harder than them, you're not going to win. Yeah, yeah. You know, count the cost carefully. But if you love it, then motivation is not a problem. But if it's just, oh, I have to do this. If I've just passed this point, I'm going to get a high enough money. In my experience, people who are motivated by money burn out in the world yeah, of yeah. programming. Maybe in the world of finance, it's different. But in programming, someone who is motivated because they love the problem is just going to outlast someone who's motivated by something else. Yeah, yeah. So my, my framework to, to switch the job is basically what would I want to do for, for the next three or five years? I think that is the, the most important thing is to actually enjoy what, what I would do. To you. If you enjoy it, you'll it be able really about, you'll, you'll be able to yeah, outwork the money. You'll be able to outwork the other people. And when you outwork the other people, the money will come. The the analogy I like to give in this circumstance is if you chase a cat, the cat will run away from you. But if you have a laser pointer, then the cat will come to you. Don't chase the cat. Find your laser pointer. So I actually have done a list about the thing that I actually need to learn and it's a lot, but they actually feel excited about it. So I think this is the, the right thing for me. But I will give it a shot. Okay, cool. We'll experiment with some more things. Try out the uh, the lead code style questions because if you enjoy that, you're gonna have a big, big, big advantage over other people. Try out the security questions on Ethernet and damn vulnerable DeFi capture the Ether is another big one. If you really enjoy that, again, that's an advantage. Now it's a competitive field, but if you enjoy it, that's a big advantage. And you can do well on it, right? Obviously, just because you enjoy something doesn't mean you're good at it. But yeah. if you have both, then that helps. Don't discount the value of working at a regular software company because you might be able to find one that doesn't require you to work that hard that can give you more energy and it just gives you more practice coding and it looks good on your resume the timing currently is not really yeah there's some for. well there's some layoffs going on but i would say layoffs always make the headlines but people are always looking to hire qualified engineers always the reason okay so some very big companies the reason why it looks worse than it really is is because the big companies they need to look like they keep growing so that their stock price keeps going up so they hire people even when they shouldn't be which is foolish financially so when they get to a point where they just cannot afford it anymore, they have to lay people off. And then they're the biggest companies. Oh, my goodness, the biggest companies are laying off people. The economy must be so bad. There's a reason most of the layoffs are concentrated at the big companies, because those companies got bigger than they were supposed to be. Yeah. It's not because the job market's bad. It's just because we can only see it. No one talks about like, oh, hey, small company that nobody ever heard of is hiring. That doesn't make the news. Tokopedia is doing layoff. That makes the news. It's not good data science that way. It's bad statistics. I think it's very clear from me. Thank you. All right. Cool. Well, try out a few things. Let me know and we'll follow up later. Okay. I will try to update my Zoom and maybe try to email you later. Sounds good. Looking forward. Okay. Thank you. Okay.